Okay, so we're going to get going here. Uh, welcome. Feel free to continue filtering in. Uh, welcome to the Open Textbook Network Summit. Thank you for joining us today for the session, It Takes a Village, Different Roles Within Successful Open Initiatives. My name is Tanya Groves, and I'm the Director of uh, Educational Programs for the Open Textbook Network. If you're not familiar with the Open Textbook Network, we're a community of higher ed organizations working together to make education more equitable, accessible, and affordable through open education. You can learn more about us at open.umn.edu forward slash OTN. I will be serving today as a facilitator for today's session. Um, and I am joined by Karen Lordson, um, Director of Publishing, and Sarah Cohen, uh, Senior Managing Director, sorry, I didn't write that out, for the OTN, who will be moderating the Q&A today. Sorry, they switched it up on me at the last minute. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to share a few important details with you. The hashtag for the summit is hashtag OTN Summit 20. We are live tweeting our session, so please join us on Twitter at, at open underscore textbooks. This webinar is being recorded. The video and transcriptions will be posted on the Open Textbook Network's YouTube channel after the summit has concluded. The last several minutes of today's session will be for questions. To submit a question for our presenters and our panelists, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom. Questions are anonymous. We will not have a chance to take all, uh, to maybe ask all the questions of presenters, but we'll do our best. We're committed to providing a friendly, safe, and welcoming environment for all attendees. You can learn more about our community norms at z.umn.edu forward slash summit community norms. Please join us in creating a safe and constructive space. And now please join me in welcoming today's presenters, a truly impressive lineup of inspiring open ed advocates. I'm so excited that they all said yes. Um, today with me, I have Sh Cheryl Coulier, who's the open ed librarian at University of Arizona, Tucson. Cheryl is a total rock star in the open ed world and a truly nice person uh, whom I've had the privilege in working with because she also happens to be an instructor for the OTN Certificate and OER Librarianship. Thank you for being here, Cheryl. Nathan Lentfer, Dr. Nathan Lentfer is an instructional designer and technologist manager at the University of Northwestern St. Paul. Uh, I had the privilege of starting an open textbook initiative at the University of Northwestern St. Paul that resulted in the first Z degree in Minnesota and its success is due in large part to Nathan's strong leadership of the instructional design team and his total commitment to making materials affordable and accessible for students. So thank you, Nathan. Uh, Dr. Kim Lynch, Senior System Director of Educational Innovations at Minnesota State. Kim Lynch truly is the kind of administrator and leader that every open initiative needs and every employee would be fortunate to report to. I'm consistently impressed with the breadth and depth of opening pro open programming at the Minnesota State System, and it's due in large part to Kim's leadership and the amazing team she's assembled around her. Emma Malls is the Publishing Service Lib Services Librarian at the University of Minnesota. Uh, and as Publishing Services Librarian, Emma kind of does it all. She focuses on all the different aspects of the library's publishing program from recruiting and evaluating publication proposals, um, to advising on the design of a publication, developing policies to maintain a high level of quality. She partners with librarians throughout the organization from the publishing services team to subject librarians who lend their disciplinary expertise to project development. And I have to say, when I asked whom I should invite, I think I got Emma's name from five different people. So thank you for being here today, Emma. And then finally, Ross Rosati, who's the director in University of Minnesota, uh, for the University of Minnesota bookstores, a place I love to frequent. Uh, my boss, Dave Ernst, founder and executive director of the Open Textbook Network, is always quick to say that Ross is huge in vocal support for putting students first and doing what's best for them is a, a big reason that the University of Minnesota has been such an early and strong supporter of open educational resources. I've traveled to various colleges and universities across the nation talking to people about OER, and rarely have I found a campus store director who's as supportive of the open movement as Ross is. I've been consistently impressed by his commitment to student needs. So with that, we'll get to some questions. Thank you, panelists, from, for being here and sharing with us today. So we're gonna go, sorry it's so boring, but we're gonna go here in alphabetical order. Um, we'll take some questions at the end. Um, and so from the first question, and uh, 
then I'll uh, switch to the order after reading the first one. Um, from the standpoint of your role, what are some of the best or more strategic things um, people in your role um, on your team have done to sustain and grow your open initiative? So we're going to start with Cheryl and there's our order. Sure, thanks. And uh, I'll start off by saying that there's no one size fits all uh, approach that works for every campus. So I'll share what's worked uh, for us at the University of Arizona um, and, and try to be kind of broad in things that you can try and, and see what your mileage is. Um, the first is to be really strategic in recruiting and advocating for OER with faculty. Um, I've, I've found success with two different approaches. One is kind of the fire hose approach where you just blanket campus with um, OER messaging and see who you get. We were really surprised this summer when we formed a Pressbooks learning community um, that 40 people signed up. And of those, I had never had contact with about 80% of them. Um, they hadn't been involved in previous OER workshops or our learning community. Um, so sometimes the fire hose approach um, can surface people who are interested that you might not know about. Um, there's also the, the dartboard approach where you're very strategic and maybe target high enrollment courses or courses that could use OpenStax books. You could target your faculty innovators, people who have won teaching awards or who are regents professors, um, people that are really um, admired by peers and could be your faculty champions. Um, another approach has been to form as many partnerships across campus as possible. And a lot of those partnerships um, that we've formed are represented by other panelists um, in this session. Uh, another, uh, or some other ones that I would mention in, would include the Disability Resource Center. They've been a really key partner for us, as well as student government. So I got invited to present to student government. One of the ideas I suggested to them was they could create an OER resolution. And I connected them with the student PERGs, and they took that ball and they ran with it. By spring, we had uh, an OER resolution. So kudos to them. Um, it's great to partner with as many people you can as you can um, be involved in as many different campus groups as you can to build those connections um, i've found it really valuable to be part of faculty senate uh, as a member of the student affairs policy committee i was part of a group that got to rewrite textbook policy for the faculty handbook uh, all kinds of learning communities uh, are useful for building OER programs. Uh, another thing, uh, tactic I would recommend is emphasizing pilots, which seem like a kind of a lighter lift for faculty, not quite as much work as, oh my gosh, I have to commit to this new textbook and completely write my rewrite my syllabus. Um, but just recommended that they just try it out, maybe even as a supplemental resource and see what students think. Uh, let's see. And, and I think emphasizing options for faculty and, and academic freedom is really important in, in building an OER program. Uh, for us, um, I always start with OER, but I also emphasize that we can uh, provide library license materials, not OER, but they're still free for students to use. And we also let them know about inclusive access, which I know can be somewhat controversial. It's the um, auto billing program, but it's a reality on our campus and the bookstores are a really close partner with us. And so um, I, I do present it to faculty as an option, let them know the pros and cons. I'd rather they hear the pros and cons from me and the bookstore than from uh, a sales rep from Cengage or, or something like that. Um, and then the partnerships with the bookstore, I'll close, are just super, super important. We try to do joint presentations on campus, jointly report savings numbers. Uh, we advocate for each other. We go to each other's conferences. So our assistant bookstore director came to an open ed and did sessions with us. I've gone to textbook affordability conferences with them. Uh, and inviting uh, 
partners to conferences can be a great way to get them really excited. Our head of digital learning came to open ed this past year, and that's how we ended up with Pressbooks. She went to some Pressbook sessions and got super excited about open pedagogy. And uh, it's one thing to hear it from me, but to hear it from other people and other peer faculty, they, they tend to get more excited that way. So those are some of my recommendations. Great, Cheryl. Thank you so much. Nathan, would you like to share your answer to question one? Sure. Um, we had a few things. Uh, Northwestern is a little bit of a different um, group, maybe it's some of the other ones, since we're a small private uh, liberal arts college. And um, our instructional design team, uh, we're what's called a full service instructional design team, which means that we help, we get, we help with our non-traditional courses. We work with faculty members throughout the design process, as well as we build it out in their learning management system, which is, could be Canvas, could be Blackboard, could be Moodle, for us it's Moodle. But there have been a few things that we have done that has really helped uh, enhance our open discussions on campus, especially in the courses that we work uh, with full service with. Um, one of the big things that we do is, about three years ago, we, we've always had launch meetings for when we do course developments. About three years ago, we started inviting library representatives there. And I normally provide them the description and the outcomes of the course so they can have an idea of what the course is about. But both the librarians and the instructional designers will look for open resources that might be a good fit um, and present them to the, to the faculty member. Librarians will also look for their electronic resources, their, what, what's in there, what's available to them online. And we found that that really shifted the conversation from the instructional designer really wants me to uh, adopt an open textbook, I'll think about it, to let's talk about the, all the options that you have available as a faculty member at Northwestern for a no-cost textbook solution to students. And so bringing in that holistic idea of um, our goal is not that necessarily that you adopt this open textbook, which would be great if you did, but that we get to the goal, the ultimate goal of zero cost for the students because the students are what's more important. And that resonates a lot better than the instructional designer holding up a book saying, hey, think about using this book. Um, so, the, um, so we found that both open and library books can fill different needs for different courses because different courses will have different needs depending on their level, depending on the, the appeal. And we have also found from a design perspective that utilizing and promoting these open books, these library books, will help faculty think more about how their books, how their resources fit their outcomes and how they can make that line from, this is what I want them to achieve to how do I get them there? How do I support the students along the way to meet the assessments, to meet the needs that I have for that course? Um, we have also had the benefit of having some early, very strong faculty advocates, especially in our STEM fields, in our business department. And so bringing those, bringing those advocates into the conversation where appropriate, um, when someone's kind of on the fence saying, hey, why don't you go talk to this person? And that will help bring that conversation from another faculty member's perspective. Um, throughout all of it, we have found that it's always good to be honest about what's out there. If they are teaching a course that you just can't find anything, then be honest, you just can't find anything. Because you're gonna have one more than one shot with any faculty member, more than likely. Uh, unless they're just adjunct and they teach once every other year or something. Most faculty members, at least they're full-time faculty members, they have multiple courses and you're talking to them maybe about this one course. And if you remember that it's more of a journey than it's just uh, through, throughout this whole process. And if you leave a good taste in their mouth about this one, about this one course, and they may, they may come back to you with another course and say, hey, do you have any open ideas for this one? We didn't make it work for the last one. We might be able to make it work for this one. Um, Tanya mentioned earlier that we have a Z degree in uh, our business department. And a few things that has helped us out there is we were very thorough on researching what was actually available before we took that plunge. We had a faculty expert who's also our program manager for that program, uh, do a lot of research, come up with a preliminary list. We utilized a combination of open case studies, open textbooks, library resources, and we got the department on board to work with us on this really early on they we had their backing so that when we came up to when we talked to faculty members like this is what the department really wants it wasn't just the designer wants this 
it is, or the open at textbook advocate wants this, is this is, a, this is something that the department has really talked about. If you have questions about it, go talk to them and see, see if this works and see, see how that will fit into what your plan is for that course. And then um, we've also started up an open textbook creation effort with partnership with the library. Um, it's a little bit installed right now, one of those ramifications of COVID on campus. Uh, some of that effort's been uh, put on hold, maybe postponed for a little bit. Um, we found that our instructional design skills that we have as instructional designers have really paired well with um, designing textbooks, thinking about activities, and uh, trying to put together a textbook that works well for students. Throughout all of this, kind of getting back to the um, main focus of the talk, is that as you build these partnerships, faculty's relationships with librarians get stronger, designers' relationships with, design, with librarians get stronger, and as you start building this tapestry of the support, everyone else benefits, and you're all going for that one goal, but there's gonna be side benefits as well. Those of, we've, the, the relationship that we've had with our design, with our librarians out of doing these um, launch meetings in particular has been greatly beneficial for many things. Thank you, Nathan. Yeah, I see Cheryl said tapestry of support and partnerships, which was definitely resonated with what, what Cheryl said. Um, Kim, are you able to give kind of your administrative perspective on this question? Absolutely. Good afternoon, everyone. As Tanya shared, uh, my name is Kim and I serve Minnesota State as an administrator uh, within a large system of 30 community and technical colleges, seven universities with seven, uh, 54 campuses across Minnesota. So a slightly different perspective as well as a different role. I, and, and this is just one element, of course, of, of uh, a variety of work that we do across the system. So I pulled my team to surface some of the efforts we've identified as successful. And I think some not so surprising, you'll hear echoes and others maybe more so. Some of the activities are support structures. We have learning circles, CC, uh, CC Certified Community Library Network, Open Ed Program Coordinator, Faculty Development Coordinator. They work together to provide support. We, we offer some incentives. We also have ensured that our bargaining units, faculty, students are in the discussions with us so that we're making our choices with, uh, with great engagement. We also try to do some fun and engaging things to promote a positive perception and to recognize our champions and our leaders. And I would say sort of lastly in that list of activities, just an evolvingly solid communication plan and materials. Beyond those essential activities, however, I think um, recognizing the enormous possibilities offered by open ed has really helped us move from a singular focus where we started on textbooks and textbook costs to a more multi-dimensional strategy tailored to different stakeholders. For example, when we started working deeply in open ed uh, six, seven years ago, we focused almost exclusively on affordability and access. The surveys were there, the arguments solid, and of course that's still a compelling message, especially to show our care for students and to show legislators that investing in open ed is a great return on that investment. Like the formerly Open Textbook Never Network, however, and I love that name change, by the way, our early work with Open Ed was really focused on open textbooks. We were very linear, linearly focused on training, review, adoption, grounded in affordability, and faculty did adopt. But what I would say is that was really transactional or transactions, not a movement. And where we really wanted to be is a movement. So in Dave's opening remarks yesterday, he talked about the practice of open ed as surfacing other voices, faculty voices, local voices, cultural voices, student voices. I felt a little bit like he read my mind and what I've been thinking about in this talk or else I'm just uh, shamelessly adapting what I hope was a CC license presentation because there definitely are some connections in, in what, uh, what he shared like Dave, who is an incredible listener, if you don't know that about him. When my team at Minnesota State listened to those who were engaged in the work early on, our strategies followed. We expanded our system work. So again, thinking about those activities I mentioned, but we really expanded our system work to include local campus strategies and faculty strategies that ultimately made some space for cultural voices and student voices, again, much as they've shared yesterday. So for example, our local strategies, in a system as large and diverse as Minnesota State, we know from experience that any initiatives 
need both leadership and localization. So in addition to funding for training and reviews at the system level, we offered campus grants because our campuses know their cultures and communities best and therefore best suited to grow their own. Those efforts were really fruitful. 24 grants and investment of uh, 150,000 plus realized over $222,000 in savings, so like an ROI of, of 42%. As importantly, it prepared a foundation for a movement. So when the Minnesota legislature last year, seems like a lifetime ago last spring, said they would provide 500,000 in funding for three colleges that have not previously had a Z degree to have a Z degree in place by this fall, yes, a few short months from now, we were able to evaluate readiness, determine that six actually could meet that goal, and we will have five actually do so with the six to follow shortly thereafter, in spite of COVID-19. And again, I would say that was based on local strategies forming a foundation that we could weave together at the system level or work together at the system level, but it wouldn't have had it been without those local strategies. In addition to local strategies, we spent some time listening to what our faculty were saying about what inspired them about open education. Fairly early, we shifted our own language from faculty training, which perhaps we should have been wise enough to like never use, to faculty development and expanded our approach with a very successful faculty-centered process. Some of you have probably heard Karen Bakula talk about OER learning circles. This was something developed by Karen, a faculty member at one of our local campuses. So you'll hear, hear those echoes of um, efforts within efforts working together. Those learning circles meet faculty where they are and provide structure for them to get where they want to be. The deep faculty development is not a textbook strategy, not an affordability strategy. It focused on helping faculty do what they do best, teach and tailor that teaching to learning outcomes of their courses as Nathan identified. These faculty strategies ultimately made space for cultural voices and student voices. So for example, we saw deep work in adapting materials for accessibility. That wasn't an expected outcome of this. We also saw focused attention on diverse perspectives, things like changing names to better reflect identities of students in their classes including modern materials of living philosophers to make it more relevant, replacing generic business case studies with local examples, changing research examples used to reflect the diversity and interests of the students in the classes. So again, some of those cultural voices, student voices also surfaced through student-generated content, such as uh, student-collected sample speeches from local communities or um, students who found and collected culture in my backyard video stories. And then I just can't help but shout out most ambitiously to faculty at Minneapolis College. It's our large urban institution, um, open access institution that produced um, an anthology called Out from the Shadows of Minneapolis, the underrepresented and a Northern Community College. This open anthology features the stories of students from diverse backgrounds and experiences. And before it was even produced, they had had enough um, momentum and enough of a movement going on that faculty committed to use it to teach cultural literacy in their classrooms. Um, I expect, honestly, that utilization to probably triple this fall based on recent events because those are student compelling stories about their own experiences. This also led to an unexpected audience and strategy for our annual, um, and that's administrators like myself. So for our annual spring conference a couple of years ago, we printed copies of that student anth anthology along with an open ed info bookmark, gave them out to all attendees and invited a student panel to share stories from the anthology in person in a session. The session was standing room only and very emotional. Administrators like me who can be compelled by cost savings for students were equally compelled by the power of student generated content, student stories and an open movement that was much more about remembering why we entered this profession in the first place as it was about access and affordability. So thinking about that title, it doesn't just take a village, it is a village. Listening to your village, to your communities as a means of identifying uh, the potential for open ed and building strategies and forcing messaging and focused messaging to maximize it. That's sort of the short version of my um, admittedly long and passionate response to something I, I care deeply about. So thank you for, uh, for, for listening to me. Um, be inspired. 
Thank you so much, Kim. Um, Ross is having some technical difficulties. He lost sound, so we'll see if we can get him back. Um, in the meantime, um, Emma, from the publishing perspective, can you share your answer to this question, please? Yeah, definitely. Um, so thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, I lead the University of Minnesota Libraries publishing team, and we have documented everything. We created a business plan. We called it a business plan. We published our business plan. We wrote an article about how we created that business plan. Uh, we started off um, on, in, in about the last five years with fairly clear cut definitions of what we do and what we do not do. We used templates, we created a sauna list, we created Trello boards, we selected the number of new publications we could take on every year. And we had to split this around between serials, monographs, and textbooks. But strategically, <laughs> the best thing that we have done to sustain and grow our publishing program is to add flex, to realize that despite our best efforts, we could neither predict nor control uh, m most things. Um, so what that ended up looking like, which I think others could do as well in publishing programs, is about three years ago, I led our team through the development of core principles. These pr principles were really the essence of our program. It's what we turn to when projects came to us from outside of our traditional documented call for proposals, or when a publication doesn't meet the definitions laid out um, you know, in our business plan. As people, I think we've learned um, all about best laid plans in the last four months than ever before. And in some ways for us, um, our core principles were our, our fail safe. They were really there for us when, um, when, when things came up that we could not control or didn't expect. Our core principles, which I've shared in the chat, uh, currently stand at 10 items. Uh, we are in the process of expanding that um, to state our commitment to anti-racism and where that plays a role uh, within the world of scholarly publishing. But I've shared the link um, and just real quick, you know, two of those bullet points um, from, the, from the list of 10 that I think really highlight what I mean by core principles instead of something that would maybe be um, you know, laid out in like a timeline. Two, two of the ones that we have included are that we believe the scholarly ecosystem works best when creators retain their copyright. So what we were able to do here is have a, a statement that we could come back to, but it gave us some flexibility when we're working with authors who might select a CC BY versus a CC BY NC. We don't necessarily want to be so prescript prescriptive in that because we can't always know all of the reasonings why an author and editor want to, may want to select one or the other. We seek to create partnerships on campus and beyond to help shape the future of scholarly publishing. So again, with this statement, it's something that's sort of broad enough um, that it doesn't define where we expect our program to move in the next five years. Um, instead, it gives us some shape to know when should we take on partnerships? Uh, when should we say, you know, we're really at capacity? So now what we've done is we've come back to these core principles when things come at us and we have not expected them to. Um, so for us, having core principles was something that was incredibly strategic, but it was not the first thing we thought of. We started with clear descriptions, um, a lot of black and white. We will do this, we will not do this. No area, no, no real, um, timing or thought about the gray area. What the core principles do then, of course, is give us um, the space and the time to meditate on those things that we otherwise might have, might have said yes or no to. So thank you. Thank you, Emma. Um, and so I think we're still waiting on Ross. So we're going to move on to that second question about um, and you can kind of take it in either way. What is the one piece of advice you'd give to someone regarding moving an open initiative forward? Or would you rather just share missteps or lessons learned? So we'll start again with Cheryl, please. Sure. Uh, so the one piece of advice I would give is to never stop learning. And for a lot of us, um, the OER and open education and open pedagogy are, are really self-taught. 
but there are so many resources out there. Uh, there's the Open Education Network. Uh, there's a Sparks Lib OER listserv and calls. Um, Abby Elder has a great OER starter kit and workbook. Uh, I have to give a thumbs up to Anita Waltz at Virginia Tech for convincing me to join and, and be active on OER Twitter. Uh, she's been uh, telling me for years, you really need to be on OER Twitter, and I, and so I, I took the plunge in the fall, and it's it's a fantastic community, and I do learn so many about so many resources and people and connections, um, so I, I do recommend that. OpenStax has uh, reopened its institutional partners program and is revamping that. Um, there's the certificate in OER librarianship. Um, I. I'm an instructor in the program, but I also learned so much from participants. And then there's the conferences and webinars and, and just uh, so many different ways to learn. And uh, so I think that really helps in being able to serve faculty and students and to, to grow a program and to know what kind of resources and, and fantastic people in the OER community you can lean on for um, support. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's so many people who are just rock stars and so willing to help and to, to share resources and templates and things like em Emma was mentioning. Well, um, Ross, are you, do you have sound now? Yep, I think I'm back. I had, I've had sound and I've been listening. I just, I would think I was in the non-presenter mode for some reason. I lost, lost it, but I think I'm back. Sorry about that. No, no, that's okay. So we've moved on to question two. Um, so Ross, I'll let you choose whichever question you want. Do you want to talk about the best or more strategic things in your role that you've done or maybe one piece of advice or missteps? You know what I'd like to do, and I'm going to be brief, I, I'd like to address that first one because it really is kind of a common theme that, that we're hearing throughout this, and that, that is that partnerships are by far the most strategic thing that I've done. Uh, from a bookstore perspective, that can be a real tough thing. I think that's evolving, but I've been in the, in the bookstore business with the university for 20 years. I've been in the role of director for six, and obviously, uh, I, giving things away for free goes against kind of what we feel we're being asked to do in some cases. And I'm an accountant by true nature. So it's really, it goes against my nature in a lot of cases, but what, what I think we learned and, and, and realized and have been uh, promoting for some time now is that while we're a business uh, asked to produce a return to the university, our real role, especially as an institutionally owned store, is to support students and support positive student outcomes. And to do that, you have to think more broadly and you have to partner with the other key stakeholders that have that same, that same vision and that same drive. And, and in doing so, I think we've increased our value. We've, 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 we've helped, I think, we've learned as well as informed about course materials on a broader, on a broader scale. And I think we've come up with some, some really nice solutions and, and have some momentum uh, in terms of moving in a direction. So partnering, even when it's uncomfortable at first, I think is the only way to go um, in, in, our, you know, in terms of where we're at today. Um, moving to an open initiative, what's, what's the advice? I think it's kind of the same messaging. Um, you can't be afraid to, to change things. You can't be afraid to do things differently and you can't be afraid to partner uh, with with others that that maybe don't have a business you know a, a, a profit motive in mind if you will um, it, it's really important that that the, the steps you're taking uh, the places you're investing your time and your energy are focused and stay focused on the students and improving the institution as a whole and and if you do that like I said I think the business model will work itself out um, you'll add more value to, to the institution and you know, students will, will trust you. Bookstores typically aren't in a position of being really trusted uh, in a lot of cases. Um, we're working hard to change and I think as an industry, we're working hard to change that. But um, trust is a, a key factor. And if you can help a student and gain their trust, um, that's gonna go a long way across, 
across your entire business model. Thank I'll you, leave. Ross. I'm glad it worked out. <laughs> I'm glad yeah. we got you back. Um, Nathan, can you go ahead and share what you'd like to for the second question, please? Yeah. Um, so my one piece of advice would be uh, to celebrate your victories. Um, it is a journey. It does not happen overnight. Um, and right now we're, we're really happy. We're at around 65 open adoptions for courses. And um, I'm looking forward to 100. Looking forward to 100. Going, going to get there one day soon, hopefully. Um, but I would recommend celebrate your victories. And then for the misstep, or I think it was misstep or lessons learned, um, one thing that we learned, that I learned, um, was to, as a designer, and this is me speaking as an instructional designer, that to, when you look at a book, also look at the, the supporting resources. Um, we had a case where we were going for a, an accounting book, accounting book, basic accounting book, and uh, it didn't have a very strong support for test bank automated test test questions and so forth, which I've heard from many account, accounting professors that that's really, really important. And um, at the time, the instructor thought, you know, I'd really love to have it, but I think I can make it work. It, it didn't work out very well. And um, so we had to uh, pull back on that textbook just to be able to bring in something that was more successful, um, that was more proven. But Happy news to that happy ending to that story is that with OpenStax coming out with their accounting books, uh, this this past year, uh, we we've, we've making steps to adopt that, as well as Cengage has a lower cost option for an account automated accounting system, which all told that makes for a better package for the outcomes, makes better package for the faculty member, less stress on them for grading, but it did teach me. To look at the to look at the supplemental materials for open textbooks and don't just look at the textbook itself. So, thank, thank you. you, Nathan. Um, Kim, would you like to share uh, your answer to the second question, please? Absolutely. I'll start with a quote from one of my colleagues, which is, uh, "Data alone will not convince all faculty on the importance of reducing textbook costs." So my piece of advice is work closely with faculty, faculty leadership, and faculty champions on a more than message, a message that includes access, flexibility, adaptability, local and cultural competence, academic expertise, professional recognition, basically unlock the deep value of open education, especially the ability for faculty to manage all elements of the learning experience and center their subject matter expertise. I think this serves that spirit of trust that Ross mentions when, when we, we, we sort of say, we're with you, but we're putting it in your hands and you can do so much. In a related way, I think um, chasing textbook savings alone was an incomplete start for us, maybe more than a misstep and kind of gets to, I think, applying to ourselves what Cheryl mentioned as never stop learning, right? We started without clarity about how to measure savings, which is still uncertain to us and imperfect and a limited measure of success. It starts or it started to feel a bit like a trap of our own making, a quest for a measure of uh, savings that's important, but also one that necessarily minimizes the value of the movement itself by putting a price on it. Again, let me be clear, I absolutely know deep down in my heart, in my mind, and my soul, how important it is to make higher ed and the materials used affordable. I know many students are food insecure, housing insecure, and that any savings makes a difference in their ability to stay and start and to persist. I'm just not sure in retrospect that I would have led with or should have led with that or will lead with that exactly in, in the future. I'd rather frame affordability as a critical consequence of teachers exercising their academic freedoms to use, adapt, share best materials possible for their courses. Thank you for that, Kim. Um, 
Emma, before we take questions, uh, can you, and I, I see there are a few in the Q&A, uh, would you like to share your answer to number two, please? Yeah, great. So from the pu publishing perspective, and I would say, especially for people working on an open publishing initiative, um, you know, advice wise, which is advice I give myself every day, make something new and do something new. Um, of course, we need interoperability and no one wants to be redundant from, but from my perspective in thinking about what open scholarship and open, in, and open education, within that we don't need an open version of a McGraw-Hill textbook. We need a new conceptual idea for what a textbook is or does. Um, some finer points, I guess, within that, um, which of course makes everything challenging. You know, in managing an open initiative, we need to onboard administrators, we have to recruit editors, and we have to present a product. In the beginning phase of an open initiative, sometimes things don't appear to be new. We might have a textbook that looks like a one-to-one -one replacement of the commercial textbook the faculty once used. Um, but we have to resist the complacency of that narrative. We also have to realize that that is what is happening. Uh, no matter the intent, open initiatives are almost always framed by libraries and universities as a continuation of the service and mission that we already have. But I think what leaders of open initiatives already know is that no, we as a library and a university have not done something new when it comes to OA and OER. Our proof is that our system still operates the same way that it did 50, 100, 150 years ago. So at the end, my advice is make something new, do something new, but realize that open initiatives will almost always attempt to be contextualized in order to fit within the same systems we range against. I, I haven't figured out like how to solve that, uh, that next part, um, but acknowledging that challenge uh, has at least brought a little more peace to, to my day-to-day -day work. Thank you for that, Emma. Um, we're going to transition now to some questions, and there are some. Unfortunately, I can't see the questions, so I'm going to have Sarah read them uh, to our different panelists. Thank you, Tanya. So um, the first question is actually for Emma. So uh, here we go, Emma. Um, the question was, can you give some specific examples of when the core principles that you referenced earlier, Emma, helped you make publishing decisions? Yeah, sure. I mean, this is actually an example that comes up every, almost every time we have a call for proposals, which right now we do about two times a year. So almost every call for proposals, um, some of the proposals that we receive are for student journals, mostly graduate student journals. Um, and sometimes they're pre-existing and like self-published on a WordPress, but otherwise it's a brand new concept for a new student journal. Um, and you know, for us, one of our core values is that we want to change this scholarly academic publishing setting. So in realizing that that is one of a larger principle, a larger principle that we have, we're able to say, let's make that investment with a student journal, which student journals, as all student work, are, are pretty labor intensive. The editorial switches over frequently. Um, so, you know, we're, we're able to say yes to those, not because we've carved out this special part within our time and budget, but because we have said that is so in step with our principles that we need to take those on. So that's probably the example that comes up the most often. Terrific. Thanks so much, Emma. Um, I'm going to ask another question from the Q&A, but I'd also like to encourage people, um, if you have questions, now is a great time to start entering them into the Q&A and we will try to answer. Um, I'm going to point this next one to Cheryl, though I imagine many of you could answer it. The question is, thinking about the fire hose method in our current situation, any fresh ideas about how to get the word out to geographically dispersed, Zoom weary, inboxed, overwhelmed faculty? Great question. Cheryl. Oh my gosh, I can so relate to this. Um, we have so many different communication tools, three different Slack channels and box and discourse and confluence and email. It, it, there's no way to keep up with all of those. So my advice would be to tag team with existing communication channels. Uh, coordinate with other units during the COVID uh, 
at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, we partnered strategically uh, the libraries, the Teaching and Learning Center, IT Disability Resource Center on communications. And so rather than each of us sending out an email to faculty, we, we partnered and did joint emails to, to reduce um, to reduce the overload and overwhelm. Um, you can um, partner with other uh, units on campus to promote each other's services. So uh, the bookstores link to our OER information and we link to the bookstores textbook adoption policies. So um, the Disability Resource Center links to our ebook accessibility information and vice versa. Um, and, and also partner with existing groups on campus, um, like uh, learning communities. We tapped into the existing learning community network to start up an OER learning community in the fall and a press books um, one in the summer. And so they have the, the integration already for the publicity and, and, and all of that support. So I would, yeah, my recommendation would be to tap into whatever you can that's existing that's not an add-on um, and extra work for faculty. Thanks so much, Cheryl. Um, we have another great question, and I think I'm going to point this one maybe to Nathan and Ross. Um, how, to, how would you navigate relationships with another office that also does OER work but where there seems to be some friction? Great question. All right, um, I'll start off taking a stab at this. The fact that you're both working on OER work means that you already have common ground. Um, you already are starting off at a place where ideally you're probably gonna have some similar goals. Um, I would say if I was going to work with another department like that, I would probably start, set up a, set up a time to meet just maybe even outside of a work meeting just to kind of talk through your pat your mutual passion for OER and then start talking about how you can build bridges and how you can share resources eliminate redundancies like you both have a, a worksheet that you both use and well why don't you combine that into one worksheet or something like that whatever it may be I'm using worksheet generically however um propose a joint project I just saw that in the chat that that's another one um but that also if you're both if different departments are both saying the same thing having the same messaging that eliminates confusion for the faculty members it eliminates confusion for um the students and who, whoever else your your stakeholders are for this because then they're hearing a unified message of this is a great this is this is what we think is a great way of doing oer um so let's start with that I would second all that. Uh, I, I guess in, in, when I've been faced with that situation, when I, one of the things that I've tried to do is to identify, you know, what is the true source of the friction here? Is it territory? Are we protecting territory? Are, are we, you know, whatever it is, what, what is the source of the friction? Is it control? Is it territory? And then from there, I guess, it, what I've attempted to do is to try to find the common ground, you know, maybe find ways to demonstrate a mutually beneficial solution. How can we do this together that, you know, satisfies both of our goals and adds value or, or, or puts, puts the, the students and the faculty institution in a better position. Again, I think that really goes back to what I had said earlier about trust. Building trust takes time. And especially in situations where there's been a long, you know, it's kind of been a natural situation where you're doing your thing and somebody else is doing their things. If you can find, find that common benefit, if you can learn to trust each other and work with each other, knowing that in the long run, you're going to end up with a better outcome, um, that, that can help. Um, primarily, for me, boils down to that. Thanks to you both. Um, I'm going to point this next question to Kim. Uh, Kim, the question coming in is, you mentioned incentivizing OER with faculty. Can you talk about the types of incentives that were offered and what you found to be most successful? Yeah, absolutely. So I talked a little bit about our, our 
learning and evolving as we go. And I think our early incentives started probably much like many did, which was a stipend connected to reviewing a textbook um, in the OTM. So that sort of was a, a first entry into incentives and, and certainly had some, um, some, some, some impact in terms of the, the, the understanding or the awareness. I think over time we saw some other things that also were, um, were maybe more effective incentives. One would be, I mentioned the OER learning circles, and while it was not certainly honoring the faculty who participated their entire time, it probably provided about one-tenth of a stipend for the time that they invested. And it was, again, less about really recognizing that we were saying, we're paying for all your time to do this, and more about saying, we respect that you are excited about this movement and want to do it, so we're going to provide some um, some incentive in terms of uh, financial incentive to come and involve. That was very successful. We also invested in some professional development for our library faculty and our teaching faculty with CC license certification. We heard that as a barrier on many uh, campuses in moving forward. So we were able to um, pay for, the, uh, for that work for them to attend that for, for free on our cost. And I think what that was successful in doing is building a community who had one another to talk to, to rely on across campuses and um, be, be more comfortable in that space if they weren't already with guiding faculty who are working with CC licenses. And so that was sort of a, 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 an incentive to, to build that work more than um, direct faculty development and adaption. Lastly, I think we prioritized local grant efforts. I mentioned the grant program and while they really were able to propose those that they thought would be most successful um, in achieving the, the goal, we really saw that those that formed clear partnerships, it wasn't a solo effort, it wasn't just a one thing um, development textbook, but those that actually took this as a systemic approach across their university or, or college were the ones that uh, the investment of those local grants really showed greatest impact and um, those were also the folks that then become, became more involved at the system level and became champions. I would also say never underestimate the incentives that aren't financial. Some of the visibility, we've done some work with uh, showcasing through, we have a stories of innovation um, series that goes out and really talks about efforts that our local campuses are doing to get this done. We have an innovation gallery where we showcase some of the press that different efforts have received. We also have worked with our our bargaining units, this is still a work in progress, but on um, building greater recognition through the professional development plan, professional development review process, so that there's recognition that isn't necessarily a financial incentive, but actually is an incentive for those who are investing time and effort to say um, that this is valued and this is something that, that, that we care about. So those are just a few of of I think um, the incentives that we've found to, to have an impact. And I would say it's kind of like a million little things. I wouldn't say it's like there's one solution that says, yeah, do this and you know, put your put your investment here and it's gonna be the right way. But it's more of how do we how do we piece these together and keep people connected with with some incentive to move forward. Thanks so much, Kim. Um, I think we have time for just one more question. Um, so I'm going to point this one, I think, to uh, Emma and Nathan. Um, the question is, on my campus, we struggle with supplementary materials. Many of the larger courses rely on commercial homework systems. At the moment, it's not feasible for them to switch because they simply do not have the teaching assistant support to provide the kind of feedback that commercial homework systems provide. Have any of the panelists, especially the instructional designers, and Emma, I pointed this to you as well as someone who's working in the publishing space, run into this problem, found a solution. Any suggestions for the open community in general on this topic? Yeah, I mean, I can kind of start on this just right off the bat, like, yes, this is a huge problem. <laughs> like the, the supplemental items on a uh, uh, a textbook, an open textbook, uh, they, they, it's it's a challenge in so many ways. It's a challenge, as somebody mentioned earlier, to connect that to like an auto grading management where 
Where are you going to even deposit uh, answers that might come into a form system? So there's gigantic technical barriers, especially when a lot of supplemental materials in, in open textbook world aren't necessarily actually embedded within the open textbook or they depend on supplementary technology as well. Um, I would also say that like it is, um, and I can't really think of a better term for this right off the top of my head, but it's also kind of the least sexy part of the open textbook, even though it's the part that we routinely hear from instructors as being the most helpful, right? Or even the students who use sort of a self-guided um, uh, assessment tools throughout a textbook. So it's, it's, it's complicated and yes, um, from the publishing perspective, I think that's still something that we're thinking about constantly. It's also something that frequently needs updating, which, impo which then is a whole new um, sort of load for the publishers. So um, I don't really have any answers on solutions. I think there are many good examples of textbooks that do a nice job of this, but more so there are great textbook authors who have done such a thoughtful job in creating those along the way. We're working on it. Yeah, from a designer's perspective, uh, I think this is probably one of the biggest hurdles that I have for talking to someone about an open textbook, especially if it is a course that relies on a commercial homework system, because that's just is so much time. Um, one solution that you might want to look at if you're looking at a math course is software called My Open Math. Um, you can uh, put together, essentially it's a homework system, you put in your I'm not a math person, but you put in your variables and that gen randomly generates questions and you can put in your own feedback. And I think that there's a way to like share your, your uh, test bank with others um, as well. So it kind of perpetuates a little bit of that open mindset. Um, so, but for some it's just, it is, it's just, it's a big hurdle. I mean, there's, there's no way around it. Um, one nice thing is that I think some of the OpenStax books have partnered with, I think I mentioned Cengage for the accounting earlier. It's a much lower cost, like under a hundred, but at the same time, yes, there's a cost, but they're not paying for the textbook at that point. So overall their cost is lowered. Um, obviously it'd be great if everything was, was open, but uh, just making those small steps. Um, suggestions for the open community on general on this topic is if you've come up with stuff, Think about sharing it with others um, if you come up with solutions because uh, some of these software systems, there's a lot of infrastructure technically behind it. So any help would be appreciated. I think everyone would agree with that. Great, thank you so much panelists for sharing um, all of that uh, fabulous information. Thank you audience for joining us. I wanna remind you today that today's webinar has been recorded and will be shared in the coming weeks. You can subscribe to the Open Textbook Network's YouTube channel to receive a notification and the slides will also be linked as well. Um, and if you wanna contact any of us, there is our contact information. So thank you so much for joining us and uh, thanks again, panelists. Have a great rest of your day.